Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to campus. Um, my name is Hamish Nicklin, and I run our creative agency team here at Google. And like these chaps here, I was at South by Southwest this year, losing my uh, South by virginity in the rain, just like here, in fact. So it uh, feels exactly the same. Um, it also feels quite amazing, actually, to be able to host this event here in this particular Google building, not office, but Google building. Because um, if South by is all about like the tech elite getting together, rubbing shoulders, networking, um, swapping stories, uh, entrepreneurs finding each other, finding the next big tech thing. Um, then in a kind of tiny way, that's what we're trying to do here in this building, um, in campus at Google. So when Larry and Sergey set Google up 13 years ago, um, they did it in Larry's mum's garage, right? And everyone knows that story. But what, what they really wanted after that was to make sure that if Google got big, we were able to support other entrepreneurs in the tech community, to find those places where we were based and where there were lots of entrepreneurial in tech spirits, just like this particular part of London, which is why we opened this building probably a few months ago now to entrepreneurs in the tech community to get together um, and share their learnings, just like people do in South By, um, and build the next big stuff, and make London the fantastic hub for technology that it should be. So without further ado, let me um, wish you a fantastic evening, um, and introduce you to your chair for this evening, Nadia Powell. Thanks, Hamish. Um, and thanks again for letting us use Google Campus. It's very nice. Um, so welcome to the IPA 44 Club. And today, um, as Hamish said, we're going to talk about what I learned at South by Southwest. My name is Nadia Pal, and I'm the chair for today, which means I have to try and keep four disorderly gentlemen in order. So wish me luck. I've got various signs that we know when they've gone over time. This is one of them. And this is the next one. So if you see me doing that, you'll know what's happening. Um, my day job is I work at DARE and I head up social and emer emerging behaviour there and um, I too lost my South by Southwest virginity. Um, I like to say I uh, popped my cherry. I think it's a little bit more, um, what's the word? Gives a bit more of an idea what happened when we were there. No, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> um, I'm really excited about today. I think we've got a really good lineup with these guys um, and some really interesting talks. But before um, we got into that, I wanted to just give you a brief overview of what South by Southwest um, is like and what happens there. So I'm going to try and talk about South by in six slides and keep it really brief because it's really about what these guys have to say today. So first of all, what is it? Um, well, according to Wikipedia, which is always a good place to start, it's a festival of film, interactive technology and music, and it's based in Austin in Texas where it should have been 25 degrees, but as Hamish said, it rained for most of the time you were there. Um, it started in 1987, um, and music joined in 92, and the interactive bit was added in 1999. Um, it is absolutely massive, and this year, 20,000 people attended just the interactive bit of the conference, so the scale of it really, really is enormous. Um, it's done wonderful things for the Austin economy, as you can imagine. Um, apparently, in 2011, injected £168 million. Pounds. So, again, that gives you a sense of the scale. Um, and it's hosted in the Austin Convention Centre. That's the kind of main hub of it. And when I, um, I stayed with some family when I was out there, when I went and said, you know, we'll be able to bump into people all the time, they laughed. And the Austin Convention Centre is six city blocks, kind of long and wide. It is absolutely massive. Um, and when I went to the first talk, I was a bit worried that I might not get in. And the ballroom we went into held 3,000 people just in one room. So that gives you a sense of how big it is. As well as the Austin Convention Centre, it's also based in the Hilton, the high so you wander around. So it really is a huge, huge um, event. Um, what really is it? I really like this phrase. I think it sums it up. It's an, I see it as an incubator of brilliance. There's brilliant people there. You're mixing with them. There's a real atmosphere of people wanting to learn and find out what's happening. Um, and it felt like a real privilege to be there. Um, what happens? Well, there's definitely a lot of networking. Um, there was a Brit mob there of people, so I got to know a lot of people within the, the British kind of advertising and technology industries. There's clients there. There's people like Google, Facebook. So there's a lot of networking um, to do. There are talks which you attend. They are run from the hour of 9 till 5. Um, and the majority of people would attend from the hours of 11 till 5 due to the things that have been happening the night before. I don't know if any of us attended at 9 o'clock. Did any of us attend at 9 o'clock? One. One. 
on the last day. Uh, oh, interesting. But I, yeah, but I was um, not in fit stage for ten years. So, um, yeah, there are basically lecture seminars and choosing which ones to go to in, in itself is really, really difficult because in any hour there's probably 30 or 40 talks going on and it's a massive variety from how to set up a business to kind of what is HTML5 to what's happening with Google+, a real broad range of things. There's also a lot of partying. This is a photo of a few people from the IPA there, Nigel. <coughs> there's you in that photo, just so you know. Um, on a night out and I think there was a really good atmosphere of all the Brits kind of getting to know each other and the event was brilliantly hosted by um, the IPA um, and also Google played a, a fair part in that as well. Who attends? There's a huge entrepreneurial set of people there, there's a huge startup village, um, academics are there so lots of people from MIT and various kind of um, inspirational education houses around the world, businesses, client organisations and agencies. Um, the people that you really go and see though are those people who speak at the event um, so a little bit of a test. Shout out a name of somebody who's up there. Who recognises anyone up there? James Muir. Uh, say that again. James Muir. Uh, I think that's right. Let me just check with his paper. Yep. <laughs> um, Al Gore. Oh, Al Gore. Very good. So the people who these are some of the people who kind of did the keynote speeches and they call high-profile speeches. So you've got um, Baraton Day, the guy in the top left who does the Onion. Um, some of the best job descriptions you're ever going to get. Amber Case, her job description is she's a cyborg anthropologist. Ray Kurzweil, a restless genius. Jennifer Pal Palker, Code for America. Um, I saw Frank Abagnale speak, I think I said his name right there, who did Catch Me If You Can. He spoke for 40 minutes, no script, right in front of the stage and told his whole story. It was very inspirational. Um, so you go to see these kind of people speak. As well as them, you also have all the kind of um, innovators in the technology space. So Pinterest did an amazing speech out there about the journey they've been on, Google. And then also you have people like us. You have agencies speaking as well. Um, so a really interesting set of people. What do you get from it? It's, it is all about inspiration. And I think if um, any of you guys ever want to build a business case for why you should get to go, um, it really does um, leave you feeling much more inspired and knowledgeable about the industry. Um, it, it also gives an opportunity to come back and talk to clients about it and to really inspire them. Um, and it creates a sense of an industry, of a set of people who are trying to change how marketing is done and really make technology um, at, the, at the centre of what we do. So that's just a little bit of an introduction about um, South By. Um, so we are going to try and give you a flavour of what we picked up um, at South By in one and a half hours. And as you can see from the range of things um, that happened, that's going to be quite challenging to do. Um, the guys are going to talk about four different things. Um, first up, we've got um, a chat about music and technology and how they're converging and how things are getting much better. Um, we've also got a talk on the five big themes that came out of South By. Um, how to speak. Um, James spoke there. Um, and he was the only one of us who actually did. So you're going to get a bit of insight on how you could maybe get um, a talk approved because it's a crowdsourcing process that you go through to speak at South By. And last but not um, least, a talk about how we should feel optimistic about the future because... Um, Technology is kind of changing things. Um, before I hand over to our first uh, speaker, I just wanted to ha leave you with one final thought. I think what's really interesting, and I'm sure you've heard people talk about it or read about it, how technology and marketing are colliding. So in the old days, we had an IT department and a marketing department. They were totally separate. Technology now is, is pretty much, at, at needs to be at the heart of marketing. Um, and it's leading to a new breed of marketeers, a new breed of clients, clients who actually understand technology. And also, I think, a burgeoning of creativity. And that's all happening here in the UK. And I think this building <coughs> is a real um, testament to this because it's all about getting new entrepreneurs and new people to, to help them on the path to success. Um, we're tonight talking about events in America. Um, and I think it's really important that we realise that we have our own version of um, South By with Digital Shoreditch, which is happening at the end of May, all around here. So if you haven't booked tickets to go and see it, there were some free tickets. I don't know if there's any left. So at the end of May, please do go along because I think it'd be really important for London as well as South By to be a, an incubator of brilliance. So that's something that I think we can all contribute to achieving. That's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Steve. Um, so to introduce Steve, he is a senior planner at Lean Mean Fighting Machine. Uh, he started life in client services and then took the enlightened path to move into planning. I'm going to say that because I'm a planner. Apologies to all the account people out here. Um, he started his career at Grand Union and then found his home at Lean, uh, Lean Fighting Machine. We all had a little meet-up before we came here, and one of the things I've learned about Steve is that he is a very passionate person. Uh, he is passionate about mobile and is really angry that clients and the industry just aren't investing in it. He's very passionate about QR codes. He hates QR codes, 
and he thinks if anyone scans a QR code, they should be shot by a sniper, which I thought was quite extreme. Um, and he's also very passionate about music, and music is what he's going to talk to us about now. So, Steve, if you want to come on up. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this is what I learned at South by Southwest. So um, lots of these guys will tell you about the big themes that uh, went on in South by Southwest. Uh, and there's lots of sort of interesting things to say. Like Nadia said, there's about 40 speeches every hour. Um, what I'm going to talk about is on one theme in particular, which is music. So, um, and the reason for this uh, is quite simple, really. Um, South by Southwest started as a music festival. So in 1987, uh, there was about 700 people, apparently, who went to the South by Southwest Festival. Uh, and about four or five different bars in Austin um, played at by a number of sort of emerging bands. I went through them all. I couldn't recognise any of them. Uh, attended by A&R guys. Um, and it was really quite a small thing. Um, and this was sort of how it started. It is a music festival. Interactive is gate crashing there. I mean, we are, we're bringing the corporate dollars, sure. But it's, in essence, a music festival. Um, so that's where it began. And that's what I thought was interesting um, to look at for today. Because... It's not this, right? Um, we don't, um, because when you're there, you don't spend your time in bars, where you do, I'll come on to that, um, at um, listening to bands play. You spend your time here in Austin Convention Centre. This is sort of where it all happens, Nadia says. This is a huge, big building. Um, more people were checked into the queue on Foursquare here, I think, than the entire of London since I've ever been uh, on Foursquare, which is kind of a sad admission in itself. Um, but this is, where it all, this is where it all takes place. But where it really takes place is somewhere called Sixth Street. Um, this is Sixth Street in Austin. Um, anyone who went to South by Southwest will recognise this is where all the bars are. Uh, and you spend more and more time here the longer you are in South by Southwest. Initially, you just go for a beer at lunch and then you go straight there from your hotel. Um, <laughs> and when you're going around talking to people um, on Sixth Street, they go, oh, brilliant, you're here for South by Southwest. This is amazing. You'll see Austin at its best. You, you have to stay for the weekend. There's an amazing festival that takes place. You rather sheepishly reply, I'm only here for the interactive festival. I'm going on Wednesday. And they sort of look at you with an air of disdain and pity and sort of say, oh, you're really going to miss... South by Southwest at its best. And I was told this repetitively the entire time I was there. So I thought, I'm only here for the interactive bit. Am I missing the real deal? So for the last two days um, when I was there, I went to as much music as I could. Well, that's my justification for sort of spending my time on Sixth Street. But um, as the festivals converged, music, interactive stopped and music took over, there were lots of, spe lots of speeches and lots of talks that that coincided. So you have people who are in music and interactive. I mean, digital and music are very sort of closely combined now, as you'd imagine. So that's what this speech is, uh, this talk's going to be about today. And the one thing that inspired me to think about it was, was this. This is Macau, um, if anyone's been there. Sort of, um, more money is spent in Macau every year than is spent in the entire music industry combined. Um, I think that says more about Chinese gambling than it does uh, about the music industry, but I thought it was an arresting fact nonetheless. Music is something that's very pervasive. Um, we listen to it every single day. It's sort of unavoidable. Uh, but there's not a huge amount um, of money spent there anymore. You know, digital has changed music. Um, you, know, it's, you can't recognise it for what it was when we were growing up. I used to go to our price to buy singles. Who's heard of our price here? Anyone? Yeah, very few of you. The, the old, you know, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so music has changed and digital has changed it. And there are lots of interesting people there trying to change it for the good, trying to put more money into the industry, trying to innovate. Um, so they're the people I sort of hunted down in the last few days to try and see what they were saying. <coughs> the first guy um, I went to see, the first person I went to see, uh, I think his name is Ken Parks. I was hoping Nadia would say his name. He was on the slide earlier. So I was like, I couldn't quite remember it. I'm like, say the one at the bottom. Um, but yeah, I think, I'm gonna, let's call him Ken Parks. Why not? Uh, but he's the chief content officer of Spotify, and he went to talk about what Spotify are doing. Now, everyone's probably heard of Spotify here. I mean, I'm addicted to it. Um, they put $250 million um, into uh, record labels uh, in the first quarter of this year. That's a quarter of a billion dollars of incremental revenue. Without Spotify, that money doesn't exist. You know, people would just use downloads. So they're generating new money. Um, and they had a lot to say, a lot of interesting things to say about how they're working with bands, um, how they're working with labels. 
Uh, but it came clear, and it probably is clear to you if you've, um, if you've used it, it's not a kind of social by design, I don't really like that phrase, but I'm going to use it, um, site. It, you know, if you try and share anything on Spotify, it's kind of cumbersome, uh, which is why they've sort of gone into bed with Facebook and seen great user numbers. But there's, so there's sort of the starting point for what's interesting that's happening in music, and hopefully what I can show you is some more interesting people I met and some more apps that launched out there which are trying to take this further and trying to add more value. But yeah, they had a lot of interesting things to say, um, but the next talk after that I went to see was by, uh, not by A-Track, um, but by um, Turntable.fm. I don't know, has anyone heard of Turntable? FM here, a few of you. Um, it's a startup. It was very big in 2011 at South by Southwest. Um, less so this year because apparently some um, internal politics within, within that as a business. But that aside, they did the talk and announced that they'd got a deal with the four major record labels when they were out there. Um, and just to give you an example of what this is, it's a real general, genuine social listening service online and allows you to find music um, serendipitously, and the reason I use that word is it was the most overused word uh, in South by Southwest. And um, if anyone else uses serendipity or serendipitous in their talks, um, then you should, you know, make some sort of noise just to say, anyone going to use that? No. Um, <laughs> but the idea is with this is you can go into rooms online um, in Turntable FM, and um, you basically enter a room like you would a club. There are five DJs at the front, all wearing massive avatar masks, like Dead Mouse, like being at a really weird Dead Mouse concert where you're, sort of your vision's gone for one reason or another. And, um, and you, can, you can be a DJ, you can put your set list on there, and you can listen to the songs that are playing. So people are curating their own set lists for you. So if you're anything like me, who just goes straight into work and puts his headphones on and, and looks down, it just provides you with a constant stream of music. And you can rate the tunes that you like, the tunes that you don't. And that adds towards someone's score on Turntable FM. And the better DJs rise to the top, much like the better eBay sellers, the more trusted eBay sellers, and get better avatar masks, like those sort of uh, manga dead mouse masks look like in the corner there. And they've done, done work with A-Track, who's there, who did the party there. Um, but they come in and occasionally do sets within Turntable. So it's, uh, it feels like a music service built for digital. It's built to find out about more music. Um, and it's, you know, has got a, a deal with labels. And the, um, the, the coder there, there's always a coder and a business guy. There's, and there's the tension between them. And um, the, the developer guy, um, don't remember their names, just developer man. He said, um, you know, build first, ask for forgiveness later. Um, which I thought was a really good, it was a very entrepreneurial way of looking at it. He didn't go to the labels and say, um, yeah, I'd really like to build this site with rooms and masks and you play lists and it's going to be amazing. Can you give me some money and license all your music to me? Um, the labels simply are not interested. He went to them when he had a built-up user community and then was able to get them on side and build his business further. It doesn't really help us in agencies because we can't just use music and go, sorry, you know, but look at our ad, it's on TV, it's good for your record sales. <laughs> That's illegal. Um, but it is interesting about how you develop sort of music products online. So that, you know, Turntable FM, when it launches in the UK, um, I feel I will be very addicted to it. Um, so it's not all good ideas at South by Southwest. There is a lot of shit. Okay, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, there are, you have to be really quite careful. As Nadia said, there's 30 to 40 speeches ev and talks every hour. How can there not be loads of crap? Um, you sort of have to sift out the ones where they go, social media is your new currency and service is your new product, and you sort of get out and walk away. Um, and this was the one for music for me. I was walking around the trade hall, and they gave me this card, and someone came up to me and said, it's a download card. So I took my phone out. I was like, okay. Can I scan it and get the music instantly? And they go, oh, no, there's a code on the back that you just put into the internet and you get the MP3 downloaded. So it's a piece of paper with a code on it that you've made to look like a card. Yeah. So you sort of have to move along at this point before starting to belittle their business. Um, so there are lots of sort of people who've gone there with the best intentions with bad ideas, but there's lots of good ideas too. Um, this is Tastemaster X, which launched uh, uh, South by Southwest, which... Um, is attempting to gamify music, sorry for swearing, um, and basically it gets on the idea of um, people wanting to be first to know, which is kind of an obvious thing with music, the earlier you know about it, the cooler you are, um, and um, so say for example if you listen to Alabama Shakes through this a year ago, rather than when Lauren Laverne started playing it, uh, you would score points, and the more, and it's basically trying to gamify culture, 
Um, I'll stop using that word. Um, but it comes to the insight that 40 million people every day spend 20 minutes on fantasy sports teams. That's, you know, that's a huge amount of time. And then I'm looking at people around here going, I look at my Premier League team every day. I look for double match week. Um, and so there's a huge amount of potential potentially out there. I don't know. It's private beta, only 2,000 people using it. But trying to take and adding a layer to what you're listening to and giving you points and allowing, you to, allowing new artists to surface through it. So it's a really interesting way of trying for you to discover new music. Uh, and for also, for thinking about it from a brand point of view, if you're interested in music, how do I find the people who are really who are advocates or influencers? Well, the people with the highest scores in this are theoretically the people listening to the most popular music before everybody else. So it's a, a way of finding out who these people are and a way for you to be one of those people, potentially. Uh, this is 45 Sound, which won a South by Southwest Accelerator Prize, uh, which I believe is some sort of it's a hack day sort of prize where you go in and you go and show your best sort of product. But it's based on, um, again, another good insight, which is if you go to a gig, you see loads of people with the camera phones trying to record the gig, and you go, just watch the concert, for God's sake. Stop viewing it for your phone. But it's the idea. has anyone seen the Beastie Boys, um, Dude, I Fucking Shot That? You know that sort of uh, thing they did at Madison Square Garden about five years ago, uh, where they created an entire DVD based purely on people's sort of user-generated content. Um, and this is sort of taking that on and making it and uh, democratizing that basically. So what you can do is if you're recording, say you're watching A-Track, you're recording it, or a band, say you're watching Alabama Shakes, you're recording it and um, obviously the sound quality is going to be terrible. It's just, you know, the receptor in your phone. What this does is it takes, if you submit the video to the site and if the band have been recording their concert, so it requires some collaboration, they will then optimize the sound on your video and then you've created a music video of, um, of genuine sound quality that you can use. So it felt like to me, this is a really great product. I mean, how many bands will take it up? You know, I don't know, but if bands start doing it and people start doing it at their gigs, that's not a hard collaboration to do. Um, then, you know, potentially, that's a huge way for those useless videos and photos at the front to become things of meaning. Uh, both to the band and, uh, and to, the, uh, to the person who's at the gig themselves. This is Artist Signal. I, I've met these guys in the trade hall while I was there. They were disgustingly young. They were like 19. It was horrible. Um, and um, the, every 90 days, they give $25,000 uh, to, to a new act, to an unsigned act. It's only for US and um, Canada artists, but anyone worldwide can vote. And you can vote only once, but for as many different artists as you want. Um, and basically, you go on, they've got all their tracks there, you can listen to them, and you can vote for your favourite. And also, you know, all the social gump that you'd expect, connect with other people, share, etc. Um, but it's a good way of sort of how digital can help support younger artists. And you, I looked at this and thought, this would be a great thing for a brand to do, you know? Why, why are Carling sponsoring venues when they could be sponsoring this? this surely this has much more value in the long term than the Brixton Academy, which no one calls the Carling Academy. Um, uh, this was uh, a very odd contraption, uh, which is hugely expensive, I imagine, but um, the idea of, for a while with, in music, people have been looking for ways to you know, convert vinyl into digital, uh, so taking all your old 45s and putting them, putting them into digital. But this is doing the reverse process. Um, so you could go and capture music from the, um, that you have, uh, you know, digitally on your iPod and put it onto vinyl. So rather than having to use CDJs and you're doing a set, you can use actual vinyl itself. Um, and I think it's just an interesting way because I think with music, the more we have of it, the more value is placed on those rare items. So because people thought vi vinyl would be killed by, uh, by digital music, but vinyl sales are growing more and more each year than they ever have done before. So it's just an interesting way of technology looking behind and providing something of value as well. This is Rexley, um, and this is basically a social music network, and this is going to sound really banal, but um, basically you, you take your track that you're listening to and you publish it on Facebook and Twitter. You know, fine, sure, I mean, anyone can do that. There's loads of this is my jam and all that sort of thing open at the moment. But these were, people were constantly pitching these out there. So this is called, this is Rexley. Uh, there's one called Soundtracking as well which is where you can take a picture and locates you and the song that you're listening to on your phone at the time and creates a sort of 
a status out of it, if you will. Um, so both Rexley and sound tracking, I thought were interesting because I thought, well, I've seen that before. Right? I can publish on Spotify. There's nothing new here. Um, but then I started to think about what does it mean more generally for social networking? Um, well, Pinterest, it's not a new idea. Okay? You're just getting pictures and saying that you like them. You know, this is the kitchen I will never have. Um, and basically what we're seeing is social networking and social media moving away from just the mechanics, because all, that's all Facebook really has given us, is the mechanics. You know, I can connect with someone, I can share with someone. It's a series of buttons that you can press, There's no, you know, and everyone's there, so everyone does it. It's not the answer. Uh, I think what we're going to get to is more niche social networks where you're grouped around your interests. You know, Zuckerberg always goes on about the interest graph, which is fine. Uh, but no one wants to do that on Facebook. I never want to click on one of those links on Facebook that says your mate has read, because you're like, I don't want to see that I'm stalking what you read. Um, but when you're in um, sort of smaller communities, I think that sharing of whether it be images and essentially music becomes more valid because you trust those people who you're there talking to. There's a shared interest. You've identified them. They're not necessarily, it's not necessarily visible to your cousins or the people you went to school with or the people that you don't really like but have to. Um, and I think that music-based networking feels, I don't want to really use the word networking, but it sort of makes sense, um, it's something that can happen. If Pinterest can create a huge storm out of just simply bookmarking pictures, then I think music, which is more emotive and more personal to who you are, um, has, a, has a huge opportunity as well. And I think looking forward that some of these startups that are coming out will be hugely, or could be, you know, the bubble, you know, the bubble is going to burst eventually, but could be um, the next sort of uh, social network in the same way that everyone got excited about Pinterest three months ago. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, was what we can do as agencies, how we can talk to our clients. Um, um, is, um, mu is how we use music generally sort of in advertising. This is for creative agencies, media agencies, media owners. Uh, publishers is it's kind of a cynical badging exercise at the moment. It's kind of, I want to be part of music, so I'll put my brand on a popular music event and then people will love me because of it. Well, as I said earlier, no one, this is in Birmingham, but you know, no one refers to the, any of the academies dotted around London by Carling. They refer to them purely by what their name is. Um, I think the only successful one of those is the O2 which is because people didn't want to say the Millennium Dome anymore because it had too much stigma attached to it. It wasn't a benefit for O2. It's just they bought something that was so low in the first place. Um, and, you know, Virgin Mobile sponsoring an event that's there. You're going for the event. So that it's, they're trying to get music to do all the hard work and the brand sort of coasts off the back. Whereas I think you should look at it the other way around if you're talking to your clients about music and how to get involved is ask not what you can do for music, Horrible. No, ask, <laughs> I'm not even going to do that. That was a terrible <laughs> idea. Um, it's, not what you, it's not what music can do for you. It's what the brand can do for music. And as what we've seen is all of these applications are essentially just layers on top of what you're doing at the moment. They're applications to make your music experience better. And I think the real way that brands can get a lot out of this and agencies can really help is by helping with this innovation process, getting on board with some of these startups now and trying to add new features and trying to give value in that way rather than just seeing music as something that already exists that your audience love, and then trying to sort of cynically take that emotional value on, on your behalf. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, and <laughs> I've got the second sign now from that, so I'm going to shut up. Thank you. Perfect timing. <laughs> Got then that I was supposed to come back up. Um, so I just want to introduce our second speaker, who is Jeremy, who's the Executive Creative Director at Weapon 7. He started his working career in Hong Kong in 1994. Am I allowed to say you're the oldest of all of our speakers? I just have. Um, he came back in 1999 to be part of the team who set up um, Glue, then called Glue Media. Um, and as I said, he now works at Weapon 7. Um, in his talk, Jeremy is going to um, talk to us about the created self which I thought was very interesting because on finding out more about him, he obviously personally believes quite strongly in the created self as well. Um, he has his real self and he has three created selves. He, he is also known as Seth 
as when he, for when he's a novelist. He's known as Jelly when he's a painter. And he also has apparently some four-lettered unmentionable names when he is a drummer in the band Provenance of Squid. Um, so a very interesting person indeed, and you can tell he's definitely um, a creative. So welcome Jeremy on stage. Thank you, Nadia, for that. First, uh, the next Provenance of Squid gig, not that I'm plugging the band or anything, is um, just by chance on the 23rd of May at 7 o'clock at the venue on uh, Great Portland Street, in case anybody is uh, interested in torturing their eardrums because we do uh, murder a bunch of traps. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about what, to me, were the five big themes that I took out of South by Southwest. Um, so it's really the five things I was left with, apart from a raging and very poisonous hangover. Um, but what I'm going to do is, just to be aware of the time, I'm going to kind of try to make these five massive great big themes into five sort of itty-bitty, three-minute, quite fleeting thoughts about South by Southwest. And at the end of each thought, I'm just going to part, part that thought and then we'll move on to the next thing. Okay? So, um, if I was to take one... Um, thought out of South by Southwest, it's the fact that for all the hundreds of different talks and for all the technology and the social media and the, um, the use of media and the use of um, just ways of looking at humanity, um, I think for me it all comes down to the insights that it could give actually and I think that's why you know, the talks may change each year and the trends may change and the, the themes may change. And I apologise in advance if I do use the word serendipity, because I probably might, right, by accident. It was one of the main themes. So whatever themes are in South by Southwest, for me, it's always distilled down to just those human insights, OK? Those basic human insights that we can use um, technology to unlock the potential of. So the first thing for me is about unlocking what's already out there, OK? So that's obviously Biz Stone, one of the co-founders of Twitter, um, so just to give you an idea about how I arrived at this particular talk, I was on my way to another talk in the Austin Convention Center, which is a, just a, a huge place. Um, so I was very, really single-minded about going to this other talk. can't actually remember what it was. I was a bit late. I was in a rush. I was walking along tweeting or something. And then I suddenly came across this massive queue. It was just the most huge queue. Um, so I thought, well, uh, okay, well, I'm sort of British. Um, and I've got a bit of the old fear of missing out. So what do you do when you're faced with a massive queue? You automatically just go and stand behind the thing, right? <laughs> Even though you don't know what you're queuing for, it doesn't matter. There's a massive queue. Stand behind that queue, right? Do you want to sort of walk lazily into one of these talks where people are sort of drifting in and out and the door is kind of porous and stuff? Or do you want to go at the end of a massive queue and think, well, there's something bloody great at the end of that queue. I don't know what the hell it is, but I want to be there, OK? So I was in this queue, and then I looked through the, um, the schedule while I was in the queue. And as Steve mentioned, you've got these kind of 40, 40 talks at any one time. And I thought, oh dear, how did I miss this? Biz Stone's talking about how they founded Twitter. Um, so that's the, the talk I was in. Um, so Biz Stone gave some really interesting insights about how they, how they started Twitter and got it off the ground with uh, Evan Williams and Jack Dorsey, etc., back in 2006. But the interesting thing for me was um, how it really gained a foothold at South by Southwest in 2007, okay, March 2007. And there was two stories he told which, for me, kind of brought everything back to just unlocking what's already out there, unlocking these fundamental human instincts, okay, that kind of underpin everything, these just simple human behaviourisms. Um, so the first story he told was, he was saying, you know, he himself was at South by in 2007, he was in the talk, People started drifting out the talk gradually, and he was like, well, where's everybody going? And then someone said, oh, well, uh, someone's just tweeted out that there's a more interesting talk going on down the corridor. So it's like, okay, that's interesting. So he kind of naturally joined the, uh, the people drifting out the room, went to another interesting talk. For God's sake, don't start drifting out the room while I'm talking and saying someone's tweeting there's something more interesting over the street. Um, anyway, um, so he thought... It's almost like a sort of um, birds flocking kind of instinct. So, so something interesting is going on. So it's human nature. You want to be involved in that. You don't want to miss out. If there's something going on of value or great cultural bearing or of influence or something that you yourself can use, 
okay, to your own gain. It's just a basic human instinct to want to get involved in that and find out what's going on. Whether it's in physical terms, which is what Biz Stone was talking about at uh, South by in 2007, or digital terms as well, which is, of course, how subjects begin and themes begin to uh, trend on Twitter. So that's the first story he told. Um, and then the second one was, he said there was a guy that was at a bar um, in Austin that he found too noisy, which is a bit strange. I can't imagine why you uh, would want to leave a noisy bar. But this guy did. So he tweeted out and said, oh, this bar's just too noisy. I can't be bothered with it anymore. I can't hear myself think, so I'm going to find a quiet place. And within minutes, hundreds of people have shown up at the really um, noisy bar because, obviously, that's what you want in Austin. You want to go to the noisiest, most crowded bars, OK? And Biz Stone was there, and he just thought, you know, it's just the physical manifestation of this flocking instinct, OK? It's like birds flocking, which, of course, kind of links in with the whole, the whole Twitter name. So, for me, that was just a really interesting insight into, um, you know, the, these, these kind of simple human behaviorisms that I don't think... Um, you know, technology is not really unlocking any new behaviours. I think there are things that are out there, you know, in amongst kind of human sort of social groups and tribes, if you like. It's just that we can unlock te uh, use technology to unlock these simple behaviourisms. And I think sitting in the talks at South by Southwest, particularly Biz Stone's talk, it just really drummed that home to me. OK? So that's the first theme. We've part that one. I just want to draw a line under it, yeah? That's theme one. <laughs> OK, the second theme um, was... Um, I went to a talk by Stephen Wolfram, who was talking about Wolfram Alpha. Um, how many people know Stephen Wolfram and Wolfram Alpha here? OK. Um, so this came about because I thought, I want to go to talks about subjects I know very little about. I think it's really important. So I was going through the schedule and I was thinking, OK, that's all familiar. Yeah, that's really kind of relevant to me. Great. Yeah, I can use that. But let's go to the thing I know nothing about. Because I thought, you know, we're trying to expand, expand our minds by going to South By. So I went to this talk by Stephen Wolfram, who is the, um, the creator of Mathematica software and also the uh, creator of uh, the Wolfram Alpha knowledge engine. Um, that launched in 2009. Um, so I was listening to him talk about how his knowledge engine works. It uses basically 20 million lines of Mathematica code, and it pulls in just huge amounts of data from thousands of disparate data streams um, in order to provide um, answers to questions. So it works in a very different way to Google. So it doesn't come back with a list of recommendations of relevant things. You ask it questions, and it's almost like where the lines of data cross, it will come back with informed answers on these things. So it's a knowledge engine, but you could also term it as a fact engine as well. Okay? There's also 250 data engineers working behind the scenes at this, uh, this knowledge engine. Um, so Stephen Wolfram was talking about, um, for example, what flights are passing overhead now above Austin? What airlines are they? Um, it was analysing Shakespeare's plays, finding out about the duration of plays, what characters begin speaking when, for how long. Let's look at a, blu a blueprint of the play and find out almost like a tapestry of the play about which, uh, which characters talk and for how long and when. Um, and the theme that I really latched onto here was, it was about d data collisions, as I've termed them, generate insight. So as I mentioned, it's almost like those disparate data streams, the points at which they cross, seem to have a lot of resonance for me. I was just beginning to think about um, you know, the nature of insight. Obviously, we work in the communications in industries, all the creative industries. Um, often, our output is really only, good, really only as good as the insight that informs it or underpins it. So you know, are there any more original insights? There's a lot of insights kind of knocking around often uh, within the industry that are quite sort of samey or they feel quite sort of something I've seen a few years ago. It's getting harder and harder, I think, to generate truly original insights, OK? Because insights are basically just um, a new way of looking at something that already exists out there. So as Stephen Wolfram himself said, it's not about the amount of data of which there is just vast amounts now. You know, there is petabytes of data out there. But it's about the ways in which we use this, this data. You know, and it takes you know, human intuition and experience 
to be able to kind of extract and use and put together this data in the most meaningful ways, often from quite tenuous different sources. Okay, so the data might seemingly be totally unrelated, but it's how you put it together to, inf to underpin um, and reveal an insight that's really important. So, yep, that's data collisions generate insight. Sorry, I got a bit carried away at the end. Um, don't be alarmed, right? This is not me attacking Stephen Wolfram, who is a very clever, distinguished scientist and actually a very nice gentleman. Um, this is just me trying to park the insight and moving on, okay? Got a bit carried away there. I faded the film down. You don't worry, they want to see what happened after I faded the film down. Let's just leave it at that. Okay, the next um, theme for me was all about uh, scarcity. So the real scarcity in the 2010s won't just be oil and water, it will be time, I think. Um, and in many ways, just walking around Austin and walking around the convention centre um, and seeing everybody out sitting in the corridors, this is a typical scene of people just sitting there, tweeting stuff out, blogging about what they'd seen, um, going on Facebook. Just, there was just a real kind of atmosphere of almost, almost like ultra urgency to the whole thing. This is not a laid back festival or, or conference. This is people that are what, trying to squeeze as much potential out of it as they possibly can. So I tried to go to as many talks as I possibly could and meet as many people as I could, but I still felt there was more to do. I felt that I couldn't achieve all the things that I wanted to achieve, okay? So I think in many ways, just this, this ultra busyness and this trying to kind of use every second of available time, just seeing this at the Austin Convention Centre was almost like a physical metaphor of this theme, okay? The real scarcity in the 2010s won't just be oil and water, it will be time. And I think the interesting thing for me here is that um, in many ways technology is overtaking us you know the power of technology is increasing exponentially it's almost leaving us behind really because whilst technology is uh, getting more and more and more powerful there is not more and more time being added to our days okay they're never going to be increased we've still only got 24 hours in each day we can't physically do any more than we can you know we can't replicate our own minds so I just thought it's a really important theme for you know, the, next, uh, the next eight or ten years is um, not just for people in this industry, but also for our consumers as well. How do we try to invent extra time? How do we inspire our audiences to want to spend more time with us? How do we make them feel that they can you know, park the, the 15 things they're currently doing and want to kind of you know, deviate from whatever they're looking at on the internet, for example, and want to spend time with the brands that we're trying to communicate? So I think it's, it's, it's a great opportunity, but it, obviously it's a huge challenge as well. Um, and um, yeah, just as I, as I mentioned, seeing it in the Austin Convention Centre really just sort of drummed that, ho that fact home to me. It was almost as if... Um, the whole thing was just wherever I looked, no matter which talk I came out of, I'd just constantly look around and there's people just constantly being as busy as possible. I read a really interesting um, column in, I think it was last week's campaign actually, by Damon Collins, who mentioned that you know, the, look of people, the look in people's eyes at South By is very different to at Cannes, because Cannes um, you know, is about sort of networking, there's a bit more of a laid back feel to it, it's about kind of you know, socialising and stuff. I mean, South By is as well, but he said, you know, that there's just a look of almost like panic in people's eyes at South By. It's not really panic, it's just this ultra busyness and this just huge drive in just for people to want to do more and learn more and nothing is quite enough, okay? So that's that one. I joined them after that, it was really nice actually. <laughs> can't recommend it enough. It's a go-cat if anybody's interested, but the kind of uh, the wet version. Um, the next thing is, the best work is always left unfinished. Was that a sign? Okay, good, good. All right, I'll, I'll speed up. Sorry, it's sort of a hint there, wasn't it? So the best work is always left unfinished. Went to a really interesting talk by three Japanese um, designers. This is one of them from a company called uh, Rizomatics. His name is uh, Mr. Manabe, Manabe-san, to use the correct vernacular. Um, you may have seen some of his stuff online, actually, about um, 
uh, face mapping and projection techniques, and he's, he's the guy that was behind the, um, the face twitching music uh, trap where he sent electrical pulses into people's faces and made their faces pulse in time um, with the music. But there was just something which um, I'd kind of thought about this theme um, for the past couple of years, but I think going to South by Southwest really drummed it home to me about um, the nature of advertising and com communications has completely changed. When it was in the broadcast days, it was, almost, it was always about finish, um, finishing and completing. You didn't release an ad until it was the perfect version. Now it's completely changed. It's about having conversations, about people making things their own. So to me, the best work is always left unfinished. There's always an experimental aspect to things. You would release things very much in the beta vein and then let people make it their own via conversations or sharing it or interacting with it in such a way that it physically becomes their own. But I think there's been a complete 180 degrees turn in the nature of communications in the past couple of years. And I think the work by these guys, um, such as Rhizomatics, re really brings that home, actually. Just that whole, almost like a childlike element to it. Let's just try these things and see what happens and just release it. We'll put it out there and then we'll move on to the next interesting thing. And I just love the spirit of uh, those guys. Not sure what he'd make of that though. Maybe best he doesn't see it. Um, the past, last point is um, all about migration to the curated self. Um, so this is an Instagram picture of which we were taking absolutely millions. Don't want to embarrass anybody, but that's my boss on the right over there. So he might be in the crowd. He might not be. Um, CEO of Weapon Seven, Adam Graham. That's my mate uh, Ben Long from WCRS. That's their friend in the middle there, and that's his friend in the middle of him. Um, <laughs> We had nothing to do with that money that's in that strap around his leg. I can assure you of that. Um, but it's somebody that we just met in the street um, and just hanged around with us for the entire rest of the, confident, uh, the conference. I just made that bit up. We just met him and had a photo taken. He uh, extracted a dollar out of my wallet. Um, so we're taking these, uh, you know, these Instagram pictures and you know, going on Facebook and sort of these constant tweets all the time. Um, and I just began to notice this, this trend, actually, before every talk at South By, there was always a sort of about a two or three minutes when people would just be fiddling around on their laptops or phones and just basically tinkering with themselves on Facebook or tweeting things out or tagging photos or checking themselves in. And it was almost like they're kind of like, uh, you know, tinkering with the lead protagonist in a narrative. So it's almost like they're... That it's their life as a novel, okay, they are the lead character, but yet they're in complete control of the lead character, and that's why it's so addictive. People can't seem to leave themselves alone in their social, social media channels. Um, so I think there's something that's been going on for the past couple of years, but I think, if anything, it's accelerating, which is this, this migration away from the real self towards the curated self, okay? Um, the more time that people spend online with their social media channels, the more that the migration will occur. So I think it's just a very different thing, meeting somebody, um, the real self, if you like, and you can very quickly make a judgment about somebody from the way they dress, the way they talk, their approach to life, their body um, language, their mannerisms, what they're wearing, okay, such as that, body language. Um, whereas the virtual self, the rules are still being, being defined. My children helped me with the making of that film. Um, so if anybody's interested, there's an essay going to be uploaded that I've wrote uh, tomorrow on the wall that's all about the curated self. And furthermore, we'll be expanding more on this uh, particular subject in Digital Shoreditch on Identity Day on the 25th of May. So that's it for me. I'm Jeremy Garner from Weapon 7. Thanks. Okay, our next speaker is going to be James, who's the Chief Strate Strategic Officer at Posterscope. Um, James graduated with a physics degree, I like these sort of facts, in 1997. Um, and joined Posterscope as a grad, so he's been there, boy and man, man and boy, um, with a focus on digital. 
He's still obsessed with physics, which I think comes through in the name that he um, called his new division. He set up in 2002, which is hyperspace. I think only a physics um, graduate would ever think of that name. Um, and hyperspace is the tech and innovation hub for um, out-of-home media. James was the only person um, here tonight who spoke at South By, and is going to give us a little bit of insight into how he wangled that, um, the trials and tribulations of it, and also how he made it a sell-out gig as well. So it was very successful. So over to James. My last slide, fantastic. <laughs> there you go, right. Um, you will be disappointed with my slide transitions, I'm afraid, after, the <laughs> after that last session. But um, so it might sound a little bit weird having a company called Posterscope um, attending and, and even speaking at, at one of the, uh, the biggest and most uh, influential digital and interactive events in the world. I mean, we're an out-of-home agency. What, what on earth are we doing there? But actually, as time's gone on, this kind of thing is getting more and more relevant to, um, to our business. You know, out-of-home is playing um, a much more pivotal role in today's sort of you know, increasingly convergent um, world. And, and to kind of illustrate that, um, if you think about the sort of work that, that the poster scope is involved in these days, we spend a lot of time trying to, uh, to understand how out-of-home media influences people's digital behaviour. So being as we've all got laptops and iPads and things like that that we're using when we're out and about, um, how does, how does out-of-home media uh, motivate and, and influence um, how, people, how people use those devices? We're also thinking about um, digital out-of-home screens, much more like websites. You know, they're all connected, so, uh, so from a content point of view, from a media point of view, you can treat them much more like the, um, much more like the internet. We're also involved in think, using things like real-time data within our planning and creating and building installations that, uh, that allow people to share experiences um, through, uh, through social media. And even, you know, humble, traditional poster sites these days can act as, as gateways to, to mobile content. So I won't talk about QR codes, certainly for risk of getting shot, but um, Near Field Communications, or, or NFC, is a, you know, a technology that we feel um, is, will radically change uh, out of home as a medium and really bring kind of offline um, outdoor media uh, and mobile together. So for those of you who don't know, NFC, um, is a technology that allows anybody with an NFC-enabled phone to touch their phone against, uh, say, a poster with a small, uh, a small tag inside it. And then that tag will instruct your phone to perform an action. So that might be opening a website, it might be opening an app or something like that. And it's also the same technology that, um, that facilitates mobile payments um, instantaneously through, um, through devices. So it was this whole area that really has got us onto the... Uh, onto the agenda for, uh, for South by Southwest. But all of that happened very much by, um, by accident. So, um, so what happened was um, I was approached kind of out of the blue by uh, a company called Mutual Mobile, who are a mobile um, development uh, agency based in, uh, based in Austin. Uh, they were pitching to get a speaking slot at South by Southwest about NFC. Uh, they'd seen some of the... Um, the trial campaigns that we'd done using NFC um, about a year ago. I thought, okay, you know, you're, you're doing some work in this space. I mean, not many people are. Do you want to partner up with us? So, of course, I'm like, yes, uh, you know, absolutely. And um, uh, so, so we, we, pitched a, uh, we pitched a panel together. But I think that one of the most interesting things to come out of that um, isn't so much the, the association with South by Southwest because, um, you know, of course, it, it's a really positive thing for you know for any of our businesses to be um, to be involved in, but for me the big thing was that it acted as, as as a real catalyst for making some real progress within you know within an organisation. So it forces you to do some work 
that's going to be kind of interesting um, and appealing and innovative and different, the sort of work that um, you know, some of the, uh, the most influential and, and cleverest people out there in interactive media are going to be interested in. And you've got to do that by a deadline. So for us, it was, you know, it was as much about like, forcing us to do something and do something now in advance of South by Southwest, because there was no way you, know, you, you can turn up somewhere like that with the same presentation you know, that you've been trotting around, for, um, uh, trotting around for ages. So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in, a, um, in, in a second. So what I was asked to talk about was, um, was how we got picked um, to be, uh, to be on, the, uh, on the speaking agenda. And now there is um, a very comprehensive guide on the South by Southwest website uh, as to the best um, techniques to employ to actually get yourself um, to actually get yourself speaking, but I'm just going to pick out a couple of the things that I think were most relevant for um, um, for us in that respect. Firstly, the um, the way that you actually get to speak at, um, at, at South by, as it seems you have to say, so uh, now on, um, the way that you get to speak there is um, is by a, a public vote. So you have to come up with an idea for your session. And then you submit that to the organisers, and uh, and they decide um, whether you'll, you'll get to speak or not. And that's partly um, based on an online vote, which you know anybody can go in and, uh, and vote for you on, and partly by the uh, the deci decisions of the organisers. So, if you do want to become a speaker, you've got to make sure you've got to be prepared to um, to go through a lot of effort to promote your idea in advance of even. Um, of even getting selected, so it's actually you know it's a really good test of whether you're actually any good at social media or not, or whether you just you know <laughs> whether you can talk the talk because uh, you know you certainly need to do that to um, to get on there. Secondly, it's important to choose the right type of presentation or the right type of session. So you've got four different types of sessions at um, at the event. You've got straight presentations, you've got panel debates, you've got intensive workshops and then you've got something called a core conversation and it's a core conversation that we actually um, we actually ended, ended up um, ended up doing and so what that's about is about the premise that um, that at South by a lot of the best experiences that you have and the most valuable experiences aren't just the things that happen in the presentations it's actually the conversations that you have outside of the presentations with the people that you probably wouldn't ordinarily talk to about the stuff that you might not ordinarily talk about. So having this, this session called Core Conversations is really about trying to formalise that and trying to get different people um, talking, to, um, talking to each other. Now, that is a little bit risky because the way that it works is that it's, it's a moderated audience debate. So you could find yourself in a situation where either like no one turns up or people do turn up, but they but they don't really contribute. So you know, there's certainly um, that kind of extra sort of scary bit to uh, to, to, to doing that. Um, I did notice that a lot of the successful um, applicants um, to become speakers had presentation titles that were kind of funny or, or witty. So there were things like um, "My Robotic Kitchen Plan This Dinner Party." No idea what that was about, but you know that was that was their presentation title. Uh, another one called "Sexy Data Solutions." Um, our one was called "NFC No Freaking Chance," which know, I'm, I'm not sure it was particularly funny, but maybe it's an American thing, I guess, and <laughs> it seemed to sort of go down well there. So, so coming up with a you know the theme we was talked about earlier on is something that, that is going to make your proposal stand out from everybody else's purely in the title um, is really important. And finally, and perhaps this is the most possibly, uh, the, the most important point, um, is to have a think about partnering up with somebody. Um, so that might be a, a technology partner or a media owner or a content company or something. Because There are very, very few advertising agencies or media agencies that actually make it through to becoming a speaker. Loads and loads of them apply, but as you, know, you saw at the beginning, there's only a couple of agencies that are actually on there. And I think one of the reasons for that is that the organisers and the attendees are looking for diversity. They're looking for kind of, you know, different sets of, of opinions. And, and by partnering up with somebody to start with um, is a really good way of demonstrating that you will get a different set of perspectives, um, you know, versus, um, versus a, you know, a more kind of regular single, single company slot. So, you know, we, we might do this next year. Anybody wants to partner up with us, then, uh, you know, feel free to, uh, to give me a shout later. So, on to my, my personal experience of, um, 
of, of speaking and, and kind of getting on there. Um, I was feeling all right to start with, I have to say, because I got on the programme. Um, I'd done some preparation, so we commissioned a piece of research about mobile NFC, and you know, that had gone well, and so I felt like um, I had some solid material with some solid content for the session, and I promoted it to lots and lots of people, and I'd invited lots of people to, to come, so sort of, kind of kind of feeling all right. And then we landed in Texas sort of on the day, and I start to shit myself a little bit, as you can, uh, as you can imagine, and I start to think, oh, you know, is, is anybody going to come? And as I say, if they, if they do turn up, will they actually, um, will, will they contribute? Or will they just walk out halfway through? Because that's absolutely fine, it seems, at South by Southwest. Walk out of someone's presentation is, is kind of the, the done thing. So I was quite nervous about that. So I thought I'd make myself feel a bit better with a few numbers. So 25,000 people attended the interactive part of South by Southwest. There were just over 1,000 presentation slots across the, across the whole event. Um, I had 51 other sessions going head to head with me at exactly at the same time. But let me do the maths and I was thinking, oh, but that's still like an average of 500 people per session. So, you know, surely I'm going to get a decent kind of room full and I wasn't, um, I wasn't too concerned. And then a friend of mine comes up to me and says, um, oh, have you heard? everybody's going to the Josh Whedon presentation tomorrow morning. He's the guy that directed the, um, the Avengers. It's on at 11 o'clock, so should we all meet there? Because that's the big thing. That's what everyone's going to. And of course, I thought, Lord, that's exactly where my presentation slot is. So from that point onwards, I then just uh, continued to worry for the, uh, for the entire time. But as it happened, all positive, and uh, people did turn up. Uh, we were actually turning people away. It was a sellout, so I was really pleased about that. And, um, and, and people did contribute. And, and the whole um, premise of the session was to talk about the, uh, the likely adoption of, of, of NFC, not just across marketing, but across society and, and business in, in, in general. So, um, as I said, we'd, we'd carried out some research in advance, and a couple of the most interesting findings for, for me were that... Um, that Early adopters of technology still don't really understand NFC, near field communications. Um, but once we demonstrated what it can actually do, um, there was a real increase in positivity about people wanting it on their, um, on their next phone. So there's still, you know, there's, there's an education job to be, um, to be done there. But they're also really positive about doing things like being able to buy stuff straight from poster sites. So you touch your phone against a poster and you've bought the product. So some real, um, so we all sort of positive thoughts amongst that. Plus, you've got two thirds of those people saying that they intend to change their handset in the in the next year. So if you can get all of the, you know, you get all of those points coming together, that suggests to me that there is um, there is a real um, a real future for um, for NFC. And so the great thing about talking about this at, at South by was the the diversity of opinions that we had in that in that session so turning up to to our event we had people from m commerce people from google from um, from banks from travel companies from um, tourism industry from the telecoms from marketing from mobile payment people out of home media people there was a really kind of diverse mix of people people that would never normally get into a room at the same time and have a debate about something so our job was really to, was to facilitate that debate um, rather than necessarily just talking to everybody, um, everybody all the time. So, so picking out a couple of the things that, that really resonated with, um, with the people who, who came to that session was, um, was, was about um, whether NFC will be ruined by the likes of us. So, you know, thinking about um, mo mobile content experiences, will we end up in a situation where... Um, Brands and, and agencies are creating content, you know, for, or directing people, connecting people to, to mobile content 
that's of low value where the you know the reward is particularly low or the content isn't optimized for mobile or the the consumer journey and the experience to get there is really clunky and longer than it needs to be which is all sounding quite qr code like and so there was a lot of uh, you know a lot of debate about whether marketers will just kind of ruin, it, ruin everything with these sort of poor mobile content experiences. And I su suspect that we will have some, uh, some shared opinions on, uh, on that, given your points earlier on. There was also talk about the battles for ownership in this area. So what you've got, um, bearing what you think about what NFC actually, actually does and the, and the kind of mobile payment part of it, what you've got is you've got the telecoms companies, you've got the, um, the handset manufacturers, you've got Google, and you've got the banks all wanting to be the banks. I said it was acceptable at South by Southwest. I didn't say it was acceptable. <laughs> um, so you've got all of these companies, they all want to be the banks. And so there's this massive battle going on. Um, you know, O2 want to be a bank. Google essentially want to be a bank. And the banks want to be a bank. So, um, so that was something that everybody felt was going to take a long time to actually work out and was really going to delay the, um, the, the adoption of NFC. Which led on to thinking about, you know, will it be the big corporations that act as a catalyst or will it be actually be some of the smaller, more innovative companies who are creating more sort of public utility uses for NFC? So things like um, helping blind people to dial phone numbers or creating applications so you can touch your phone against a table in the bar and automatically order another round or touch your phone against a poster to connect to a Wi-Fi network. Those sorts of kind of high value experiences that smaller innovative companies uh, and people like ourselves are probably more likely to be, um, to be developing. And then finally on that, you know, what will Apple's dominating position be like? Will we find that they have uh, a sort of a mobile payments position much like they do in, in music? And there was a lot of views of people going, yeah, do you know what? I can imagine you going and paying for your coffee using your iTunes account if you can touch your phone against, uh, you know, against the till. So, so there was a real kind of um, possibility of that, um, of, that, of that actually happening. So that's all I was going to say about, about NFC and, and, and my slot. Just to very quickly finish off on um, uh, some perspectives on a couple of other sessions that, um, that I went, for, went to. There was a lot of talk about socially ambient mobile apps. So these are apps that, that look at your preferences and your behaviours through your social network, combine that with your location, and then suggest people that you might want to connect with in the real world in similar kind of locations. So you've got apps like Glancy and, and Highlight. Um, so I thought, well, South by South was a great place to test out these sorts of things because you're going to have loads of early adopters there, a real critical mass. So I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll have a go on that. And, um, and Glancy suggested that uh, my best match, my top person that I, should, uh, that I should meet up with, was this American massive bodybuilder guy <laughs> wearing a T-shirt with the sleeves ripped off, posing in front of a tank. So <laughs> now I'm going now. I know we both like LL Cool J, according to the app, but there's no way I'm going to go and meet up with this guy. So that was the end of my experience of socially ambient apps. But interestingly, Facebook then um, bought Glancy, and uh, a couple of days later, or last week rather, and, um, and have since closed down the service and going to do whatever it is with them. So that's quite, um, quite interesting. Um, across a lot of the, the solo mo, which is probably the other kind of thing you should, probably shouldn't say, um, Across a lot of those sessions, there was so much focus on privacy and data and ownership of data, which you know, clearly that's really important. But it got me thinking, is, you know, is this going to end up stifling creativity and innovation in, you know, in the mobile space? I'm not suggesting that we should be acting irresponsibly, but with so much focus on, on that side of things, it couldn't help me think that... Um, make me think that there are probably loads of good ideas that are going to get killed because of too much worry about this when actually, you know, with some thought it could grow into something. Especially as the way that, you know, what people are comfortable sharing now versus what they'll be comfortable sharing with in a year or two years' time will no, no doubt be very different. So, um, so I thought that was kind of quite an interesting um, observation. And then finally, sort of about thinking about devices themselves, you know, um, um, you know, smartphones and iPads and, and things, and, and <laughs> thinking about how they might evolve as the cost of technology comes down. And there was this thought that um, 
that over time you could have a situation where you don't necessarily carry around your tablet and your laptop and all that sort of thing. Instead what happens is that you get given or, or you borrow those devices in particular locations as, as you move around. So you know, in some hotels you, you, know, you already get, you can, you can borrow an iPad um, for, uh, for, the, for the duration of your stay. But there was the thought about as time goes on actually will that just become much more mainstream and will you have a situation where like in your local greasy spoon the pile of free newspapers for you to, you to use while you're there is actually a pile of you know touchscreen devices that are essentially almost disposable and you just kind of you know borrow them whatever so I thought that was, I thought that was quite an interesting thought and sort of bringing it back to um, to out of home clearly if you do have a situation like that that just means more people being able to connect to more content and more services when they're you know when they're out and about and of course the um, the importance of out of home media or influencing that behavior um, you know, just becomes uh, becomes even more um, even more prevalent so that's it hopefully I was almost on time was I nearly <laughs> um, if you do want to um, to get hold of any of the uh, the mobile NFC research that we carried out there is an infographic that you can help yourselves to and you can get from any of those three bases if you can uh, actually read that. So thank you very much. Right, we're now on to our last speaker and then we'll have hopefully a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So I'm just going to introduce Raj who is Innovation Director at AMV BBDO. Um, I'd like to describe Raj as a geek to the very core. Um, he's spanned the continents, he's moved from client services to planning, another one, um, and he survived the dot-com boom and crash, and it's all because he has a love of the intersection between marketing and technology. He's also an optimist, and what he's going to talk about is about how hopefully technology will lead to a, a greater future. Um, he's also optimistic about his dancing. He claimed on several nights to be the best dancer at South by Southwest. Did not. So I think we need to you get him to give us a little bit of a spin whilst he's up here. So I'll hand over to Raj. Hello. 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 Should I kill you now or later? Yeah, give us a twirl. Yeah. I said kill, not twirl. <laughs> Uh, who here is quite into technology, considering the audience? I think quite a few people would be. Uh, and I don't mean the really, really, really geeky stuff. I just mean just loving technology. You live with your smartphones. Um, you can't quite live without your smartphones anymore. So um, I felt like a kid in a candy store at South by Southwest. Uh, really got into quite a bit of the technology. Um, so if you break down the types of technology, technological conversations that they had, you had the, uh, the very sort of detailed, you know, what do I do with HTML5 uh, to NFC and social media and all sorts of other stuff. And then you had like future thinking technology, which was all about, you know, what is technology doing for society and what is, you know, how is society going to actually change and how are we going to be impacted over the, uh, the course of the next few years. Um, my first experience with technology bringing people together, um, back in India, I was born in India in Kerala, I don't know if anyone knows Kerala, India. Small village, I lived in a house sort of like that, much smaller, less fancy. Um, we all had um, verandas and if our village was so remote that um, when TVs finally showed up, um, most, of the village, I mean, most of the rest of the world had TVs. We, we got TVs so late uh, and only some of the houses can actually afford TVs. So when we got it, what would happen is um, all the verandas in all the villages would fill up with all the local kids who, uh, who didn't have TVs and all the families. So whenever our version of EastEnders or whatever came on, um, it just was an amazing thing to just see wherever you, wherever you, were around, wherever you went around to see all these people just uh, being brought together by technology. So since South by Southwest is quite technologically led, uh, and my font is broken, um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, overall like the technological sort of impact and you know, why a lot of it made me quite optimistic about the, uh, the future. And I hope it makes um, us optimistic about our industry as well, because I think we work in a very cool industry. Um, a lot of different worlds come together, uh, as I said earlier, and as everyone's been talking about, it's very te technology-led. Uh, the last probably seven, eight years, uh, a lot of social media, um, creativity, a lot of agencies are starting to come uh, show up now. Um, I would say the last, um, couple of years, last three, four years, uh, before three, four years ago, brands and agencies weren't that welcome because it was a very tech startup mentality. 
we do not want to sell out. Uh, but now they're starting to see the value and brands are coming in and actually bringing a lot more value in addition to uh, the dollars. But when you have like all these things coming together, I think a lot of magical things happen and, 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 and it becomes a very inspiring place. Um, obviously, we all love working in our industry and I think we all sort of face particular challenges. I think everyone's in advertising, is it? Or is client side or mainly advertising? Um, we're always looking for more uh, revenue generation opportunities. I mean, that's like one of the big things. We can't do the same things over and over and over again for our clients and then expect to continue to make money because the world is changing, technology is moving. Um, we have to sort of move along with it and see what you know, can sort of give us a bit of direction. Um, we're fighting with attention. I think one of the guys talked about attention. Um, we're dealing with a very enlightened audience. I, I think from the last five years of dealing with technology and social media, I think we all feel that, uh, massively more intelligent. So the consumers are pretty much the same way. We're fighting to find a way to get as much of their attention as possible. Um, as I said earlier, that uh, we can't keep doing the same things for brands. Brands can't keep talking about how wonderful their products are. They have to look at value and finding ways to uh, align themselves with value so that people buy into a lot more of the thought. So how do we actually keep uh, building belief in our brands? And then as an extension of that, I think there's a bit of a stigma uh, about, our, about our industry sometimes. I think there was a joke uh, or there was a line that uh, was like, don't tell mom that I work in advertising, I, I tell her I work as a piano player in a brothel, is it, or something like that. Um, unfortunately, the stigma is there, but I think there's the opportunity in terms of creativity and technology is, is quite wonderful. To take it one step further, I think we all, you know, it, it would be kind of nice to actually find, you know, a little bit more meaning and fulfillment in what we do, rather than just going out and just selling product. Um, so, a bunch of different challenges that we face. Um, there's also a lot of shit going on. Um, <laughs> crisis, uh, people saying shit about brands, you know, banks and corporations letting people down. Um, newspaper, industry, the publishing industry, uh, the, the music industry completely and utterly dismantled because of technology. Who's to say that our industry is not gonna feel the same sort of uh, effect? Um, riots, um, you know, nations coming down. Um, but what's really nice is when you go into South by Southwest, even with this sort of uh, environment, things are quite positive. People have this sort of can-do um, collaborative mentality. And I'm going to read you a quote from Time Magazine. If you guys get a chance, um, Time Magazine did a really, really good special on South by Southwest two, uh, 2012. Uh, there's a whole series and lots and lots of really good write-ups, so you should go check it out. Uh, so South by Southwest is a bubble of optimism, a haven of ingenuity that seems liberated from all the constraints or cynicism of daily life. If you think about advertising and all the cynicism that we go through, it sort of disappears. There are conceptual talks here that forego all notions of funding or commerce. Yes, money is involved, but it's not only about the money, um, which is where the optimism comes from. And then you have demonstrations where you feel like you're taking a peek into the future um, about how people are going to in, uh, interact with each other and interact with their worlds, even within two or three years from now. I'm not sure if you can read the next one, but topically, there's, I think one of the guys said there's about 1,000, 2,000 different talks. Uh, if you pick out like a couple of these, like is don't just sell things, change the world, the Prius-inspired bike, the future of digital health, people power technology and the revolution. So even just looking at the type of topics, I think you feel like things are changing. It's not just make something to sell or make something for the hell of it. It's just what can we do that's a lot bigger and, 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 and do something for society. So yeah, so technology innovation is making humanity a lot better. From our perspective, I think if we look at a lot of what's going on, you know, we have a place to find a bit of inspiration. And if we start seeing where things are going, it might start driving you know, what we can do for revenue, for brands, for even for our uh, industry itself. So one particular um, um, arena is governments. Um, I don't know if anybody recognizes the guy on the right, uh, Sean Parker, Justin Timberlake, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> um, quite an odd dynamic duo, getting Al Gore and Sean Parker together. Um, obviously, Al Gore is a, a politician, and Sean Parker recently has been quite getting very, very passionate about uh, politics and about what people what people can do to change governments. So uh, Al Gore was complaining about the, uh, the elections in Florida. And then even now, I and mean, if you've been hearing about everything that's been happening in the States, he says that democracy has been hacked, absolutely and utterly hacked, by money. 
uh, not by causes, and by TV, because TV has become the massive platform for discourse. So if that's the way that people communicate and that's the way that people receive information, there's got to be a way around it to get people back to the causes again. And he had a very nice quote that for the first time in human history, everyone has a voice that can be heard by the masses, um, which you've, uh, you know, case in point, everything that's happened uh, in the Arab up uprisings, um, the stance that the internet took against SOPA and, and PIPA, um, um, Al Gore and Sean Parker, they're basically backing like all these different uh, 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 associations and companies like causes, which is essentially like just giving, but actually creating an entire cause, creating an entire social network. Um, voters in, basically getting loads of, loads of different voters who are like-minded, but getting them all together. And then in every community, there's a leader. But what leaders may not have are the tools to actually create communities, to actually go and uh, create a cause that can actually eventually change government. So there's all these things happening around government. And there's dozens and dozens more of these sort of organizations that are Quite, quite interesting. Excuse me. Um, who has seen the homeless hotspots uh, controversy? Has anyone seen it? Does anyone have an opinion? How many people have seen it and think it's a good thing? How many people have seen it and think it's a bad thing? Okay, I personally think it's a good thing. I, because uh, I volunteer for a, uh, another homeless organization. Anything that actually brings light to an issue like this Maybe the execution was probably not as well thought out as it could have been. I think, I th it, it, this just basically says this is the stepping stone. Because if, if one person does and they do it wrong, the next person might come and do it right. Which is very, it's more important that someone actually does it. And the most important thing is the homeless guys who are actually carrying out around the wi wireless routers, every single one of them were ecstatic. They felt like they had a role, they were making money, and they felt like they were actually contributing to everyone else around them. And suddenly they became a part of society. And I think that's the way you have to look at it. So um, in an event like this, these kind of issues get forgotten. And I don't think it should be just about making money and all sorts of other stuff. I think you can, you can tackle loads, loads of these type of issues. And charities are a big, um, big uh, uh, part of uh, South by Southwest in terms of how they want to use technology and all these things to, to, uh, to make better for themselves. Um, how many people do not use Foursquare anymore? I've stopped using it. I've sort of stopped using it. I just, I just, after a while, it just became, what's the point? You know, I get a bunch of badges, I become a mayor, I get up some champagne, but, and then a bit of kudos, but who, who cares? I mean, it becomes a bit of a nuisance, actually, because it's not real value. Um, not that Foursquare is not smart. I think they're quite an innovative company, and they were very smart when they came out with it. They just have to innovate a bit, and I, th I believe they will. Um, but as Nadia mentioned earlier, Amber Case, the cyborg anthropologist, she started looking quite into uh, to location-based services. Her feeling is that we're all eventually going to become cyborgs. She's absolutely convinced that, uh, that uh, the way that we're actually adopting technology, if you forget your phone at home, I think I, I generally freak out. I have to go back because I feel like I've lost a limb. Um, there's no reason that you know, this is not the beginnings of you know, our sort of cyborg life. I mean, just give it some time. Um, but she looked a little bit further into uh, to geolocation and uh, geofencing, as she, as she calls it. She's uh, started a company called Geoloki. You should t t take a look at it. Uh, there's an app. I think there's an uh, app on iPhone and, and Android. It's essentially taking location-based services and importing it onto your app or your service and then actually creating a little bit of value. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so you're flying into Los Angeles and you land and your flight's actually quite late. Uh, but because of your location and your time, it figures out um, what, you know, what sort of the phone actually, uh, phone or whatever device actually, figures out what sort of information it can give you. So it tells you where you need to be, your entire itinerary. Um, and then it cross-references with the local bus schedule or the train schedule, whatever else you need to do, gives you the next schedule. Um, and then you might want to take a nap on the, uh, the train. But the, tra but the phone's going to wake you up because, because of location and time and making actually use of it, y you can actually do something with it rather than just getting badges and uh, getting some free champagne. Or you come home and uh, you could tell your husband or your wife, I mean, the phone tells them in, that you're actually five, ten minutes away so you can put something in the, in the, on the stove. Same thing with work. You walk into Sainsbury's, if it immediately tells you what you're meant to be buying because you've been making the list, but because you, you, you don't have to tell the phone that you're in Sainsbury's, 
it brings up the list because you know they, it knows you're there. And if you get into the, uh, the A&E for some reason, your medical reports get transmitted as soon as you go through the door. Suddenly, geolocation becomes quite useful and you know of value. Uh, or you can find something a bit more poignant. Um, um, let's imagining this is in the future. Anyone heard of Ray Kurzweil? Kurzweil? Yeah? I don't know what Nigel has. Um, big uh, futurist, uh, inventor, writer. He's been like honored by like loads of presidents. Um, he's from Queens, where my folks live, actually. Um, and he's, I'm not going to get into his talk, but the things that he talks about, and if you can, hunt his talk down, because the, it's, it's absolutely amazing like what he thinks about the future. Um, anyone heard of Moore's Law? that technology and computing power is growing at an exponential rate. He said that the mobile phone that he had in his pocket it was one billion times um, faster than the computer he used at, uh, as when he was a student. So based on Moore's law, he's been making loads and loads of predictions. Founded on fact, I have no idea, but I think they're quite interesting. Um, humans will integrate computers into their bodies. We will become cyborgs. Uh, robots will become sentient. sentient. Uh, robots will not become malevolent, and if they do, uh, it'll be our fault, obviously. Um, Skynet, and we will upload our conscience into the cloud. That's his feeling, is that uh, through nanotechnology and the way that uh, uh, now you have machines that you can all control with your minds, it's not going to be that long where you can actually uh, put your entire mind into the cloud and store it and achieve immortality because of nanotechnology. It's really far out there, but it's really interesting to, to, uh, to hear, though. Um, a lot of people criticize him about uh, technology and his love for technology, but he says some people lament uh, technological progress, but technology is the only thing that has allowed us to rise uh, from the shit. Um, Jane McGonigal, anybody heard of Jane McGonigal? She's quite a fascinating lady. She's a gamer, uh, and I hate to say it, because somebody else said it before, but she's a gamification fan. Uh, we've heard gamification probably too much, um, but there's some merits to it, and I think it's still something that needs to grow. I think as a concept, it can be quite interesting, particularly with this example. Um, she had an accident. Uh, she bumped her head, and she had a concussion, and she was, uh, the doctor said, oh, you'll get, get, uh, you'll get better in a few days, uh, and she didn't. In a few weeks, she didn't. Uh, in about a month, and she started going a bit stir-crazy, and she almost wanted to commit suicide because she just, just lost a little bit. Um, so she got together with her team and said, I, I gotta get out of this. And the only way to get out of this is, is to exercise my, my head, my, my mind. So she created a little game to just give her a bunch of tasks that she can just keep doing to get her out of the concussion. She realized she can actually turn this into something much bigger for mankind. If you wanna quit smoking, uh, if you wanna deal with a breakup, if you wanna get over the loss of a loved one, if you uh, reduce your um, uh, blood pressure, any of, any of these things, quit smoking, whatever it is. Um, so she made this game called Super Better, which is about making human beings super better. Um, and she says it's all about resilience. So creating resilience through repetition um, in the physical, mental, emotional, and social states. There's an app for it, by the way, uh, and it's also online. So if you look it up, you can give it a go. And then, um, you know, if you want, you can get partners in. I'm getting pointed at. There's only a couple more slides. And basically, you just get loads and loads of quests and loads of little small tasks. And it starts really small, like, you know, let's just, just you know, jump around the room a bit or shake your hands with it. Then it becomes more complex and complex and complex. But the more you repeat, the more that you develop and grow. So anyway, you, we don't have Nike Fuel Band here yet, right? Is it launched in the States? Is it, is it launched here yet? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. It's, the same, it's almost the same principle. It's just basically making you more aware of your movements and then, you know, giving you back, uh, feed, giving you feedback. Dean Kamen, anyone, anyone? You know, I know you know this guy. He invented the Segway. Um, but that's not the only thing he invented. Uh, her picture is all over the web. Just look up mommy Segway. Um, not that that's where I started, okay? Um, but um, he's invented quite a bit, uh, quite a few things. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a number of things. And his talk was absolutely amazing. He almost he had a standing ovation because of the, the way he was thinking and, and also what he was contributing, uh, what he was actually doing. Um, his philosophy is that everybody has to be able to participate in a future that they want to live in uh, or they want to live for. That's what technology can do. So even if we are brands, we have to think about what they want and then find a way to sort of 
bridge the gap. I'm not saying we're going to build all these things that he's talking about. We find something that either talks to those values or gets, gets us halfway there. So he looked at a number of problems. Uh, he looked at military amputees. Um, he, took, he looked at wheelchairs. In fact, you can't go, go up, up, up a set of stairs with them. Uh, looked at clean drinking water in poor parts of the world. And he looked at children's, the children's view of science overall. Really, really big, um, if you really want to think about the, the future. He's built the most amazing set of prosthetics. Um, and he's all, he's all over TED Talks. These guys were basically doing everything that we can do with their fingers, but because it, it was all connected to the way they were thinking. And I mean, using you know, tools, et cetera. Uh, and, it's, and it's starting to look really, really good. Um, he's built the, uh, the, the wheelchair that goes up the stairs. He's built the water purification system. This cost a lot of money, but they were trying to find a way to bring it down so they could actually bring it to a lot of poor, poor parts of the world. You can pour mud into it. And it actually uh, brings out, like, and he's, he tested it in, you know, at a massive demonstration where he drank the water. But the most, the most amazing thing is it's almost self-powered. It, it can run on methane. So if you're thinking about Africa and India and whatever, you just need to put cow dung. And, and that is amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, he's also set up this organization called, this program called FIRST, which is all about enthusing kids. Uh, to think about scientists and engineers and, 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 and not Will I Am and, and the Spice Girls. We need to have a cultural shift so that young people look to scientists, inventors, and engineers the same way they idolize athletes and celebrities. Everyone thinks they can be an NBA player and make millions and get on to BGT and too much likes done. Um, I don't know if anyone watches The Office in the States. Uh, he's the absolutely freaky character. Um, he's a, obviously an actor and a comedian. But he had a bit of an improv show. And in the improv show, I mean, he did crazy things as he would. He's an absolute nutcase, breaking uh, guitars and all sorts of other stuff. But he launched this uh, company as well called Soul Pancake because it was all about de spirituality, which was very odd considering him as a character because you would never think of him being into spirituality and thinking about the big questions. Because his feeling was that the, you know, answering the big questions, there are some people who know the answers, and there's loads of people who have it, but they're afraid to ask. And he thinks everyone should have an access to spirituality. If you think about that as a concept, about ev opening everyone's minds up, just like opening up kids' minds about the schools and, and science and stuff, I think it, it feels like a really, really, it could be like a nice future. And then finally, last couple, last couple of slides, this uh, company called Earthcast, um, they're actually gonna have a live stream of the Earth. They're building an uh, infrastructure with the uh, space station and all the different satellites where you can actually zoom in. You've, if you think about Google Earth and YouTube and mash the two of them together, it's essentially that. And, and they're going to be launching that very soon. And you can actually pinpoint down to about a meter, which is actually quite scary. Um, so yeah, so I've got to hope that technology is going to continue solving problems. But as an industry, I'm hoping that the more that we look at it, it inspires us. The enlightened audience thing is very important. We have to be smarter. Um, and we have to think about, you know, adding value, you know, creating movements, you know, giving back. Uh, and then the more you do that, you build audiences and you build business. So Biz Stone says it very nicely, no matter how many awesome things we build, change is not a triumph of technology, it's a triumph of humanity. That's it.